creation. There's a lot of you that I recognize here in the, in the pews. It's so awesome. So I feel like I'm coming back to family over here. And, uh, and so today, I, I, uh, 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 Steve told me I had... Uh, or sorry, Sean. I'm sorry. It's a running joke that we have. Actually. I, I, he told me I had five hours today, and so I did a nine-point sermon. We're wow. wearing jewelry. We're not going to wear jewelry anymore. We're going to let our hair grow long. You know, none of that temple cutting of the hair on the sides, guys. No razor shall touch your head, right? All these things. So we're just going to get underneath the law, and we're going to get quiet, right? You're allergic to that. You're allergic to that. Oh, yeah. That's right. I forgot. I forgot. Yeah, I'm allergic to that, too. So I was so allergic, I died to that. And so I think you guys died to that as well. And so we're just we're just celebrating this new life, and it was just wonderful to hear the testimonies here, just the exhortation to the church, and it was just so wonderful. You know, as I was uh, coming into your fair city of uh, Ganagenthal, if I'm saying that right, I have to see my man in that accent. I come actually I come from uh, southern Manitoba as well, so I'm allowed to make those kind of jokes. But as I was coming in, actually, went, one of the things I uh, just mentioned immediately to my wife Jackie is to uh, is that I wanted to speak about the unity in the area, right? That's not my main point here, but I just felt that as soon as I was driving in, I told I told Jackie, I said, I want to talk uh, about the unity in the church, and it was so wonderful to hear that from Anne about that unity. And you know, the thing is, uh, we can often find ourselves, as we learn about the Spirit of God, as we start to get excited about this new life and start to see the manifestations, right? We can start to think that somehow we are better than others. I know that we wouldn't say that out loud, maybe we wouldn't even think it that way. But I know I was involved in a church for a number of years, an amazing church in Niverville. And I noticed uh, during that time that we were experiencing things that other people weren't. And, and when I was experiencing things that, that other people weren't, I somehow it just kind of crept into my life that there was something happening inside of me that wasn't happening to them, that somehow there was them and us. And you know, that division doesn't exist, right? There isn't them and us, right? right? Them and us doesn't exist in a family. And I love what was being shared uh, by Janessa here, that he is our dad. You know, the revelation is that he's our father. He's our father. He's our dad. And we're his kids. And that is the primary uh, identification that we have. You know, he, he's not our grandpa, and we're not, we're not uh, adults. That's not the way it was portrayed in the Gospels. You know, if we, if we were adults, if he was grandpa and we were adults, then the, there would be a lot more responsibility on us. There would be a lot more responsibility, but he doesn't paint that picture of grandpa and adults. He paints a picture of dad and kids. Yes. And as kids... You know what? The pressure's off. The pressure's off. I believe, I believe, and it's not in the scriptures, uh, so this is just the, the gospel according to Kevin, but <laughs> you can look that up later on. I'll be in heaven somewhere. And, and so I just, I just believe that at some point we will mature because children do grow up. Right. But you know, in this, in this age that we are right now, we are kids. And so I just want to take, first of all, I just want to take the pressure off of you today. Sure. We're kids. We're learning. We're bumping into the walls. There was a, Ruben's got a wonderful child. He's seven months old, right? And, and I noticed that when I met the little guy, he was missing one of his shoes. Well, you know what? We're allowed to be missing one of our shoes. It's okay. And you know, I, I just really want to just, you know, we need to see ourselves. We need to give us our, ourselves some room. And don't be critical on yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. We're going to be losing our shoes. We're going to be losing our toys. We're going to, we're going to swipe somebody when they take our stuff. You know what? It, it, it's okay. It's really okay. And Jesus is not surprised. The Father is not surprised when we bite somebody on the head, when we, when we step on somebody's you know, toe when they're not looking, when we steal their toy. You know what? We're learning. I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying we're learning. And so, and so often, that we, we have a tendency to beat ourselves up. And so I just want to give us a freedom to grow. We have freedom to grow. And uh, I, just want, I, just want to, I just want to release that because I think things can get so serious. Yeah. Right? So serious. Yeah. We're, we're going for eternity. Our, our tents might last 80 years. They might last 120 years. Maybe they'll even last longer than that. You know, the, the idea that we're only going to last for 120 years comes from... Uh, scriptures where it's talking in, about in, in Genesis, I think, with Noah, 
It says, my spirit will be not, you know, cannot be with more than 120 years. I can't remember the exact quote. But did you know in the genealogy after that was said, did you know that there was somebody that lived to be over 200 years old? 200 years old. And it says 120 there. Because you know what, we, what we've done is that it says my spirit cannot coexist with man more than 120 years or for 120 years. And we've misinterpreted that. That's not an age that we are limited to. That's actually saying how long it was going to be until there was the flood. That was, that was 120 years to the flood. It wasn't 120 years how long we're going to live. I believe our bodies can live a very long time on this earth. I believe that there's a revelation coming of who's living on the inside. And what's happening? You know, if Jesus was on this earth, I'm pretty sure he would have lived a whole lot longer than 120 years. Yeah. And you know what? I believe that time is coming. But that's not, again, that's not my main point. I didn't want to, I'm just going off to the side a little bit. I'm allowed to run on the rabbit trails a little bit. But I wanted to talk, I did want to talk a little bit. I want to start off with just sharing some of the things that have been going on in Winnipeg. I've been to Africa. I was sharing with Ruben. I was in Africa last year. And I got to see, you know, I got to see my first deaf mute person get his hearing back and his speech back. And that was wonderful. That, that's a great testimony. And I was down in Australia in the last year. I was down in Europe in the last year. I've been in different places. But you know what? And I've been to the States. I've seen all kinds of stuff all over. But you know what? Sometimes when we talk about these places that are thousands of miles away, we somehow disassociate and say, that's happening over there, but it's not happening here. But I can hear just from the testimonies that things are happening here, big time. And you know what, I want to encourage you that things are happening in Manitoba, yes. big time, Amen. huge. You know, I, I think uh, 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 it was posted up on Facebook about seeing eyes open, and some of you guys may have seen that close. And we've seen roughly in, in central, uh, downtown Winnipeg, we've seen about 100, roughly 150 people get their sight back, either people that were completely blind, had no light, couldn't see anything, or had some kind of vision difficulty. Often, uh, a lot of them had a lot of vision difficulty, and they got their sight back right in central Manitoba. And it didn't happen five years ago or ten years ago. I was with my daughter on the streets two Thursdays ago. She just came in, uh, visited me over Christmas, visited her family over Christmas. She's, she's going to Hillsong uh, College out in Australia. And she came back for Christmas, and I, I took her on the streets, because every Thursday, and a number of you know that, but every Thursday we go on the streets, and there's sometimes 20 of us, there's sometimes 50 of us, but there's, there's, a, there's a growing group, you know, they're, and they're not just coming from uh, Winnipeg. They're, you know what, I would say that 95% of them are not from uh, the church that we're meeting in. Almost nobody comes from the church that we use. It's people uh, like John, uh, he's here somewhere. He's somewhere here. There he is. He comes all the way from, from here. He comes all the way to Winnipeg. And he sees stuff. And we've got people from St. Pierre. We've got St. people from St. Anne's, from London, all over rural Manitoba. They come out. We get together on either a Thursday or a Saturday. But on Saturday, Thursdays, we go out in the streets. And a couple weeks ago, I was with my daughter. And so she came out with me. And she had heard some of these stories. And so when we were walking around downtown, we were in one of the malls. And I ran across a lady uh, that... Uh, I noticed that she had glasses on, and I asked, uh, there was three of them, and I said, how's your sight, how's your hearing? And uh, the one lady said that she had 30% vision. And so I said, okay. I said, uh, I, I told her, I told her, I said, you know what, we believe that God loves you, and could we pray for you? And often I don't approach people in the street in that way, I'll, I'll be a little sneakier sometimes, I'll just, I'll tell you how that works. But anyways, with her, I just felt relaxed to tell her that. And uh, she was open to that, and I asked her to take her, her glasses off. And there was a poster about six feet away where we were standing. Well, there was a poster from about here to the guitar, and it had letters like four inches uh, high on it. And I, I asked her after she took off her glasses, I said, uh, can you read the letters? Can you tell me what letters are on that poster? And she said, no, I can tell there's some different color there, but I can't, I can't even make up one of the letters. And so I said, okay, I, and I had about four people that I was mentoring that evening, and I asked her to come forward, I asked my daughter to come forward, I said, it's your time. And so she came forward, and I said, put your hand on her eyes, and she does. And she's looking at me like a deer in the headlights. Have any of you ever been out on the streets, and it's your first time praying for somebody, and you're like, what do I do? Jesus! And so, you know, even after she's been in Bible college for the last a year and a half, and she's been involved, she was just like a deer in the headlights, and she looks at me, and I just said, say this. And she's looking at me, and I said, "Say this." I said, "Blindness go in Jesus' name." 
And she goes, why this go in Jesus' name? And she's looking at me again and said, take your hands off. And so, okay, I'll take my hands off. And I, I smiled at the lady. And you know what? Her smile went from ear to ear on that lady. Ear to ear. Ear to ear. And I said, what happened? I said, what happened? And she says, I can see. She said, I can see. And I said, I said, uh, how good can you see? And she says, 10. And I said, is it 10% better? Because I'd asked her before, and she said her vision was 3 out of 10. And she said, so she answered 10. I said, 10% better? She said, no, 10 out of 10. I said, what are you saying? She said, I can see everything. And I took my, I took my wallet, and I took my medical card out of my wallet, and I stuck it two inches from her nose, because she could see everything far away. I stuck it two inches from her nose, really close. And I said, read this. And she read my name right off the top without hesitation. I knew that she had her sight both far and near. And I said, how long has your vision been like that? How long have you been living with 30% vision? And she said, I've been living like that for 38 years. 38 years. That's crazy. And we just saw that, you know, that night, I just told you one testimony, but that night we saw four people get their eyesight back. That's one testimony of four being out on the streets for two hours. And so we've seen, I think we've seen four or five people now in central Winnipeg come out of their wheelchairs that were paralyzed. I saw a lady just this last Thursday that had a stroke since last March, and she lost the use, uh, most of the use of one side of her body. She was still able to walk around with a cane, and she, was, she had a backpack. And I said, uh, can you lift this backpack? I were having a conversation, and because uh, I, I was, gonna, she was going to walk away. Uh, we were visiting with her, and she's going to pick it up. But she could only use one arm. And I said, well, try to use her other arm. We're going to just engage in the conversation. And she tries, and she strains her fingers, but the, but the knapsack that weighs about 10 pounds doesn't lift. And I said, hey, you know what? Can we, can we just show you something uh, neat? And she's like, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm just going to touch your arm. And then I said, I want you to try it again. And she, so she was open to that. And so she, we just, I just touched her arm, and I said, try lifting it now. And you know, she just took it and she went like this. And she's holding it. And she's not putting it down, she's, she just lifts it up. 10 pounds, she's like, I don't know, she's gotta be a seven year old lady. She's just holding it up like that. And I said, well, I don't really know you. I don't really know you, but that looks like a change to me. Cause she couldn't even, she couldn't even budge it before. And she said, yeah, that's, that's a definite change. You know, and then she, she put away her cane and started working, walking and she noticed a change in her walking as well. And those are just recent examples, but we see, uh, if any of you have been uh, friends with me on Facebook, we posted up a couple months ago, a deaf mute, deaf mute, 24 years old in Winnipeg, known to the deaf community. She was in the mall, I saw her uh, passing notes between another lady, and that lady, I, I recognize that because I've seen that before. I see when people are passing notes from, I recognize that. And so I walked over to them and I said, hey, is your friend uh, deaf, deaf and mute? And she says... Uh, yes, my friend's deaf and mute. And I explained to her that I wanted to pray, we wanted to pray, we see miracles. And was she open to that? And they communicated for a bit while she was a little bit shy, but she was willing to be prayed for. And so we prayed for her, just laid our hands on our ears, did a quick command prayer as your pastor, I'm sure, has taught you, and, and Sean has taught you as well. Just command in Jesus' name. Uh, ears open and took her uh, took her hands off and just for the first time in her whole life, 24 years old, she could hear. She could totally hear and she could hear loud. And so that's amazing, right? And actually, after I posted up that video of that person being healed, I actually got contacted by three people from the deaf mute community in Winnipeg. And they said, you can't put that video up. And I said, why not? They said, because we know that she's, she's deaf and mute and you're such a liar. And I said, well, when's the last time, I had three people I had this conversation with, I said, when's the last time that you had a conversation with her? And, and some of them said, like, six months ago. And I said, well, I said, I said uh, you need to talk to her. I said, she was like that for 24 years, but she's not like that anymore. I got a text from the lady that was passing notes. I, I texted her the next day, and I said, how's, how's your friend doing? And she said, uh, she's got a problem with her hearing. And I thought, well, that's strange. I just prayed for her, and she just got her... Her hearing, what kind of problem could she have with her hearing? So I asked her, I said, what kind of problem she had? She said, she said, everything's too loud. Everything's too loud. I guess if you live for 24 years without hearing anything, it's too loud. And so I just I just talked to the deaf mute community of about three people that contacted me and I said, you know what, I just I just contacted her again today and there's nothing wrong. You know, none of them have gotten back to me. And we've seen that, we've seen that with kids. 
In Winnipeg, we've seen that with a number of people. We see miracles, signs and wonders. And so that's your destiny. The reason I share that over you is because that's for you. Everybody here is eligible. There's nothing special about my life other than I have received, I have received the Spirit of Christ. And as we share, we're wall to wall Holy Spirit inside, right? Wall to wall. Right? And these are tents. These are tents that we're walking in. Uh, but in, filled in the inside of us is the Spirit of God. It's our spirit and His spirit. Did you know that our spirit and His spirit are one? Right? We're like, we're like uh, coffee. I often, because I go to the malls and I'll, I'll share testimonies and I'll, sh I'll share the gospel. And I tell people we're like coffee on the inside. I said, once coffee has been added to hot water, try separating that. Try separating that. We cannot. And you know what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that if you're joined to God, you're one spirit with Him. And so oftentimes, we'll divide Him from us. We'll talk about God, and we'll talk about us. And we, we talk about as if we're two separate, uh, two separate beings. But you know what? We are made of the same DNA as the Father. The Spirit of God is inside of us, and there's no difference between Him and us. We are immature and growing. Right? We're the children, and He is mature and full. But you know what? We are made of the same stuff. And never look at yourself in any way other than you are made of the, of the very substance of God. And so I want to bring it over to, uh, at some point we're going to talk about some scripture, right? It's good to use scripture, right? It's great to hear testimony, but it's good to hear the Word of God as well. So uh, for those of you that want to just uh, use a couple of scriptures, let's turn over to Genesis 1.26. Whether you've got your uh, Bibles or not, you're, you're, you're going to know the scripture. And so Genesis 1.26 says that, that we were made in the image and the likeness of God, right? You guys know that, right? I'm not going to quote it, but we're made in the image of likeness of God. And he said that now we have dominion over the, the birds and the air and the fish, like all the things in the air. All these different things, we have dominion. We're made in the image of and likeness of God. And that's who he says we are. That's how we were made. And so when uh, when when Adam was created, God breathed into Adam. Who knows that God breathed into Adam, right? And he became a living soul, the word says. And so when he breathed into him, we might think of it like uh, C CPR, right? He lived, boom, got his heart going, he breathed into him. So we might think of it that way, but I'm going to paint a very different picture. I don't believe that that's all what it looked like. In fact, the name Yahweh, right? The name Yahweh, when we say Yahweh, we're actually not saying it right. I don't know if you know that or not, but Yahweh is actually not supposed to be pronounceable. The way it's written uh, with the, with the uh, consonant and syllables and so on, it's not possible to say. And so I'm going to try my best to say Yahweh the way it's actually supposed to be said. And it's supposed to be said like this. <gasps> You guys know that? <sighs> because Yahweh, actually when it was told to Moses, it was actually breath. It was actually the sound of breathing. And it was like, it wasn't pronounceable. It's not like when we talk, you know, we have very pronounced uh, sounds. But, but the name Yahweh is actually... Isn't that amazing? That's truly amazing. You can research that. And that's not opinion. The Jewish people, if you take a look at the scriptures, or you go on YouTube, you'll see hundreds, if not thousands, of videos talking about Yahweh being the breath of God. And so that's what it is. And so they believe, the Jewish people teach, that when a, when a baby is born, they take in, and their last thing that they do is exhale. And so their spirit comes from God, and then their spirit leads back to God. That's the, that's the teaching in the Jewish understanding. And so Yahweh is the breath of God. It's the breath of God. And so when he when he breathed into Adam, he actually breathed his name into Adam. He breathed his name into us. He breathed his identity into us. His identity. His name is identity. Did you know that they that they killed Jesus because they made him he said that God was his father? You know why? You know why they didn't like that? Because everything that the son has, the father has, or everything that the father has, the son has. That's the way it works. And so, if you say that this is your father, then the inheritance and the understanding is that you possess everything that the father possesses. You possess, and because you call God Father, this is why we want to crucify you, right? And so, this is this is huge. This is huge. When when Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism, what do we hear? What is her, right? You are my beloved son. son. 
Yes, in whom I am well pleased. This is our identity. This is who we're made. And so God wasn't just doing a CPR start in, in the garden. He was breathing his identity into us. We are the incarnation. We're the, we're the physical manifestation of the identity of God, of the name of God. That's who we are. That is who we are. Because spirit, who knows that spirit is untouchable, right? Spirit is, you know, when Jesus, when God talks about himself or displays himself, he, he shows himself as sometimes as fire, right? Fire. Sometimes he's fire. And fire is all powerful, right? It can do amazing things with fire. But who knows that fire has no substance to it? Fire has no substance. And when God speaks a word and creates, who knows that words, right, are powerful, but they have no substance, right? You can't touch a word. And who knows that when Jesus is talking in John 3 about being born again, he talks about the wind. And he says the wind, it's the Spirit of God is like the wind. And who knows again? He's using an analogy that wind, right, can blow over trees, can do all this stuff. But guess what? No substance. No substance. And if you, t- if you start to take a look at the different things, how God displays himself, you'll see, you know, for example, love is an emotion, an intense emotion. He said God is love. He's not, you know, loving. He is love. Again, love is all powerful, yet no substance, right? No substance. And so spirit is without substance, but with all power. And the reason I tell you that is when he breathed his name into Adam, when he's breathed himself into us, that part of us, even though you can't touch it, it's all powerful. It's all powerful. And so all powerful has come into you. Identity has come into you. And whether you can touch it, don't judge it by what you can touch. So when you close your eyes and you spend time with the Father, I want to see. I want you to see yourself as made of that fire. You're made of that word. You're made of that love. That's your identity. These things are your identity. This is how we worship in spirit and in truth is by identifying with the spirit. And if we use our if we use our tense, if we use this outward five sense way of judging ourselves, we are not going to see ourselves properly. We need to see ourselves through the identity of Christ. We need to see it through the identity of the Father. This is who we are. And we are light. We are life. We are love. We are, we are all powerful in Him. And when we take on this identity, when we take on this view of who we are, you know what happens? We become risk takers. We become risk takers. We are able to walk into situations that the flesh is afraid of. Because who knows that if you're made of, of flesh and bones, if this is who you are, who knows that you can't lay hands on a person with a, with a tumor and see it vanish, right? We can't. But if we are light, if we are life, if we are love, if we are healing, if we identify with the Father, guess what? When, when that part of us lays hands on the sick, miracles happen. Miracles happen. You know, when I was in Cuba, I was in Cuba, uh, and uh, there was a, a boy and uh, a mother that came forward. And uh, the, the boy had a tumor or something that was about halfway around his neck. And it was raised, and it was, it was red. He had white skin with this red raised, something was growing on his neck. And the, the mother came forward with uh, a large tumor on her, uh, on her arm. It was huge. It was, it was probably about 10 inches at least, and was raised, I don't know, probably a good inch, inch and a half. It was massive. And so they came forward for prayer, and we'd seen a number of uh, miracles already in that service, and she came forward, and I laid my hands on both of them at the same time. And when I took my hand off the woman's arm, the tumor was still on that arm. Who knows that sometimes it takes a moment, right? Sometimes it takes a moment. Jesus prayed for a number of people. I want you to know Jesus prayed for a number of people, and they ran away just as sick as they came to Jesus. I know that you, you're thinking, what he's talking about? But it's true. It says within that very hour, I can, I can give you lots of scripture references. For example, the, uh, the, um, the, ten, the, the ten lepers that came to Jesus and said, you know, have mercy. And Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest. And you know what? When, they, when he said that and they checked their bodies, there was no change. They still had leprosy all over them. But it says, as they went, they were what? They were healed, yes. And so they were at that moment, they were just as leprous as they were just before Jesus spoke. And so sometimes, it takes, and there's, if you start to research, you'll see a number of times within that very hour. You know, and it didn't always happen. The, the, the blind uh, person that came to Jesus, he was as blind. There's one story where he, he was just as blind uh, after Jesus prayed for him as before. Until he washed his, his eyes in the pool, 
right? He was blind. He still had to walk like 1.4 kilometers or whatever to that pool. So he was blind all the way there. You can only imagine the things racing through his mind. And so I want, I want you to remember that because just because you don't see it instantaneously doesn't mean that it's not happening. And so anyways, with this lady, she still had this growth on her. And so I took my hand off this little boy. And guess what? When I took the hand off the neck of this little boy, that the skin was exactly the same on one side or the other. There was no redness. There was no raisedness. The tumor that was growing on his neck was completely vanished, as if it was never there. Never there. It was completely... And you know, when I left that church, I got, a, I got an email from the translator, and the translator sent me an email. It took me two and a half weeks to get it, because email doesn't travel that fast, and I didn't have email in, in Cuba, so it took me a while until I got back. But you know, I got an email from that translator that was helping me that evening, and she said, when you left the church, the lady's tumor completely vanished from her arm. Totally vanished. And so I don't know if it was 20 minutes or whatever it took. I didn't see it. I saw the little boy's tumor, but it took a little bit of time. I don't know exactly how long, but it, it did disappear. And so when we lay hands on the sick, know that light and life and love, the identity of, of God in us, right? We're, 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 we're small versions of God. God's small G. Jesus calls us that. I know that might be disturbing to some of you. I, actually, I think probably none of you know that already in the scriptures because you guys are part of this congregation. But we're God's small G. And, and that's our big G. Right? And we are made in the image of likeness of God. And so we have the ability as ambassadors of Christ to lay hands on the sick. We have, a, we have authority. You know, an ambassador, an ambassador has all the rights and privileges representing the king, Right? And so when a, an ambassador goes to another country, did you know that an ambassador has the authority to start a war? Did you know that, that, that the Canadian ambassador, I met the Canadian ambassador uh, when I was in Cuba, I met the lady that was the, the ambassador from Canada to Israel. And I met her on a beach. I met her on the beach a couple months ago when I was in, I was in Israel. And that was a divine appointment. We actually got to spend an hour and a half with the ambassador. And she was in her bathing suit and we were in our bathing suits. And we we're just sharing the kingdom with her. And that was a total God set up. But do you know that she has the authority to actually start a war with, with Israel? She has that authority. And it says, uh, it says that we are ambassadors of Christ. And we carry the same authority as the kingdom. And we can, we can bring that here right wherever we are. So we can go to the devil. We can go to things that are right. And we can enforce it. We have, the, we have that authority to enforce it. And so getting back to... Uh, Genesis 1.26, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And then we're going to flip over two chapters to Genesis 3.5. Genesis 3.5 is when Satan is in the garden with Adam. I know we usually say it's Satan is in the garden with Eve, but that's actually not the way we read. Who knows that, that Eve wasn't Eve until after the fall, right? It was just Adam male and Adam female. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. But you only notice that Eve got her name after Genesis 3, 5. And so it's Adam male and Adam female, there were one. And so in, in Genesis 3, 5, the, the serpent is talking to, or really Satan is talking to uh, the female version of Adam, and, and, and he says something interesting. He says, if, if you want to be like God, you got to eat the fruit, right? If you want to be like God. You know, and she saw that the fruit was wonderful and everything. And in order to get this, get this knowledge, she had to eat the fruit. And it was inferring that she wasn't like God. The very fact that if you want to be like God, you need to eat the fruit. See, this is the thing. And so, this is what Satan is always trying to get us to do. It's all, he always uses the same old trick. He doesn't have ten tricks. He has one trick. And it's old trick. And once you recognize that trick, it'll be very, very easy for you to stay on track. And so the difference is in Genesis 1.26, it says you are made in the image of likeness of God. Genesis 3.5 says if you are made in the, if you want to be made in the likeness of God, you've got to do this thing. And so that's the start of religion, right? We talked about being allergic to religion today. Religion is anything you have to do to be like God. Anything. If you've got to do something to be like Him, guess what? You swallow the, you swallow the, the, the lure. There's nothing we need to do to be like God. There's nothing. We're totally incapable of doing any action that will make us be like God. And so we are made in the image of likeness of God. And to believe that we are not made in the image of likeness of God is a trap. So what happens in, in, in uh, Jesus in the desert is you have the, you have the devil coming to Jesus, right? And he says, if 
you are the Son of God. Yeah. Turn this stone into bread, right? If. And that's the whole thing. You'll read every single temptation. It's always if you are. So it's not, you know, sometimes we look at the end of the scripture and it's like, oh, what was he doing with that bread? What was he doing with, you know, falling off the, the top of the temple or whatever else it is, right? And those, and those are representative, I believe, of the different, the three different, the flesh, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the three different kinds, the pride of life, uh, the, you guys can help me, the pride of life, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes. I, I turn to that, but the whole thing is, if you are, if you are, if you are the Son of God, if you are the God of God. And so once you try to get into that mode of trying to be like God, that's where the problem happens. And so when I go, when I go into my closet time with the Father, I don't come to Him trying to be like Him. I don't try to, you know, empty myself and, and, and ask for a bunch of forgiveness and, and go through some process to get back to God. We're not getting back to God. If we're getting somehow getting back to God, right, we've got a wrong image because we are already made in the image and likeness of God. We are. We are. We're not getting back. You know, Jesus forgave us. God forgave us. God reconciled yes. who to who. I think we get that mixed up sometimes. We think somehow God had the problem, right? And then, and then somehow He came to us. And that's not how it reads. We're the ones that had the problem. And He reconciled us to Him. And so we're not, we're not the ones that fix the problem. And you know, we can go in our closet and try to fix the problem. And that's not how it reads. It says that He came to us. You know, God came to us. God came to us in Christ. He came to us. You're not going to Him. If you could go to Him, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. He came to us. And so quit trying to come to Him. He came to you. Recognize that He came to you. He came to you. And this takes the pressure off of you guys. It just takes the pressure right off. Because if you've got to do stuff to get to Him, guess what? That list never goes away. That's where Satan wants you. He wants you thinking that there's separation. You know, when we, when we go to a, a wedding and we talk about, uh, you know, if uh, let no man separate what God has put together, right? And we use that in the wedding. But to truly use that verse in context, it's actually talking about us and God. <clears throat> let no man, you know, separate what God has joined. He's talking about us. And don't allow, see, religion will separate you. And say, oh, you've done this mistake, you're having this problem in your finances, you're having this problem in your marriage, you're having this problem wherever, I'm not healed, I'm not this, I'm not that. And so somehow I'm separated from God, and if I just do this scripture thing, if I just do this tithing thing, if I just be nice to my wife, if I just do whatever, right, I can get back. I can get back. And the truth is, you can't get back. That's why Jesus came, because you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, right? And so we got to just stop it. And if we're allergic to religion, we just got to stop the whole process of trying to get back to God, right? And when I go on the streets, when I go to the street and I talk to, you know, in a month, I might talk to dozens and dozens of people. I, I love going on the streets. I, I'm full-time in ministry, my, myself and my wife, and we go on the streets often. We talk to people. And, you know, the number one thing, when I, when I go onto the streets, people, you know, I, I deal a lot with the First Nations because that's a lot of the course. Not everybody... I get a lot of immigrants and, and some other people as well. But you know, the core message that I get back when I talk to people about Jesus is they are, they use this term backslider. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, yeah. backslider. Yeah. I actually, I, I didn't really grow up with that in my mind up upbringing, but maybe you've heard it a little bit, backslider. I think the Baptists sometimes use that backslider terminology. Well, whoever uses it, doesn't matter. They use it. And they say, I'm a backslider. You know, I accepted Jesus 20 years ago, but I'm a backslider. They, they put their eyes down, I'm a backslider. And uh, I was up in Cross Lake, and I ran into a gentleman by the name of Raymond. Raymond was about 15 years old, and I had the opportunity to go to the school in Cross Lake and just share the gospel there. And while I was in a, a hallway waiting for somebody, I, I had three students walk by, and I said, I said to them, I, hey, who's got you know, physical problems? And I had a little uh, sled of hand. I was tracking the students that were interested. And I found three students had a physical problems on their body. And so I, I laid hands on... on uh, one of them, and they were healed, instantly healed. And of course, I caught the attention of everybody else watching. And then this guy by the, by the name of Raymond, well, 15 years old, was kind of behind me. And I just was sharing that Jesus had healed this one person, and we had two more to go. And Raymond, I, I, I said something to him about Jesus. And Raymond said, well, I accepted Jesus two months ago, which is awesome. 
And then he told me, and I'm a backslider, he said, I've been drinking and I did drugs, and I'm totally disqualified. You know, he didn't use the word disqualified, but he was like, bang, I can't do that. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'm going to hell now. I don't know exactly what he's thinking. I don't know what backsliders think where they're going. I'm not, I think they're just confused. But anyways, Raymond said he was a backslider, and, 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 and he was like, boom, he was down. And I said, Raymond, I said, Raymond, I said, come over here. And so Raymond came over, and I said, he told me about his backslider thing. I said, Raymond, you're not a backslider. He's like, yeah, I am. I need to confess this is... You know, I'm the priest there for that moment. He confesses all this bad stuff. And, uh, and I said, Raymond, I said, that's not true. I said, God is with you always. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He's with you. He's with you now. He's totally with you. And I said, Raymond, I'm going to prove it to you. And I said, Raymond, come over here. So he's right beside me. And I had these other two students that needed healing yet. And I can't remember what it was. But they definitely had some serious problems in their bodies. And I said, Raymond, I said, lay hand on this first person. And so Raymond, very obedient, he puts his hands, and I said, Raymond, say this, in Jesus' name be healed. And so he says that, and he takes, I said, take your hand off, Raymond. And sure enough, that student was totally healed. And without giving him a moment to think about it again, I had him put his hand on the next person. And we did exactly the same thing, and he took his hand off, and guess what, that second student was totally healed as well. Totally healed. Everybody was healed, and all those three people were healed, and I said, Raymond, I said, if the Holy Spirit had left you, how did you do that? How did that happen? How was that possible? I said, obviously, somebody misinformed you. I said, the Holy Spirit never left you. He never left you. It's okay. You know what? Raymond, Raymond, when he saw that, when it came, to, when the lights came on, Raymond had a smile. He had a big smile. He gave me a big hug. And he, he was just, you know what? He was just set free in that moment. And so, you know, we need, our job is, is we are reconcilers. And we're not just reconcilers to those that are outside of Christ. We're reconcilers even to those that have accepted Christ but have bitten into the apple of religion. And so it's our job, again, coming back to uh, unity in the church, right? We're not going to stand there and, and tell people based on their actions, based on their you know, wrong belief systems, whatever, somehow they're disqualified. The Holy Spirit hasn't left them. They're not backsliders. Maybe we don't use that word. Maybe they think, we think they're religious. You know, we use other words. We think they're an idiot. We think that they're, you know, whatever, right? Whatever, all the things that we're not going to say aloud, right? But we think they're all, you know, somehow they're half demon possessed. No, they're, <laughs> they are in Christ. They are in Christ. And we need to affirm that the Holy Spirit's inside of them. You know, Jesus doesn't, doesn't get there and beat the, the living daylights out of those that are already down and out. He doesn't beat, you know, the only person, the only group of people that Jesus was beating on was the people that were totally lost, blind. It says that he called the Pharisees blind, leading the blind. And he was hard on them. He wasn't, he wasn't hard on them because he wanted them to go to hell. He was hard on them because he wanted them to join him. And so he wanted to raise the standard. He wanted to say, you know, if you guys are doing this, boom. You know, if you think you haven't, if you haven't murdered anybody, you're doing okay. But if you can not murder, you know, you're in trouble. If you, if you haven't, you know, uh, if you call somebody an idiot, you know, you're in danger of hellfire. If you, if you haven't taught, you know, done these things, if you've ever thought wrong, you know, about a person uh, sexually, it says, you know, that you committed adultery with this person. And so when he was raising the standard, he was raising the standard to show them that they weren't meeting it. But you know what? People that are down and out don't need that message. You don't need to go... You know, and it's very rare that we'll need to use that message, depending on who you're talking to. We don't need to use the message of beating people. The, the message that we have, most of these people here know that they failed. It's, it's, it's only the high flyers that think they're doing everything perfect, that message for everybody else, you know, needs the message of grace. They need the message of grace because they know that they failed. They know that they've disqualified. There's many people here in this congregation, to some degree or another, that believe that they're disqualified from receiving a miracle today. I can tell you that miracle signs and wonders are happening in this uh, in this Sunday morning meeting. I can guarantee you, signs, wonders, and miracles. If you came here needing a miracle in your body, the presence of God here is not separated from you. There's nothing separating you from a miracle right now. And so we're going to be spending a little bit of time on that later on. So I just want to prep you up. I came here to see signs, wonders, and miracles. What about you guys? Amen. Yeah, you came here to see signs, wonders, and miracles, right? Because the Word is in total sync with signs, wonders, and miracles. But I just wanted to, I just felt to share with you, first of all, that, that we need to find out that we're not disqualified from them. And whether it's the church next door, 
whether it's our neighbor here, right in the church, none of us are disqualified. Backsliders are not backsliders. Jesus didn't come up with the terminology backsliders. You know, when you think of when you think of uh, Thomas, doubting Thomas, who, right? Immediately we have, we know who it is, right? Who's, who's doubting Thomas? We know it's the disciple, right? Do you want Jesus' disciple? Did you know that the, the doubting Thomas is not in the Bible? Hard to believe, right? We all know who doubting Thomas is. Did you know that's 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 true? That's Christian tradition. That's tradition of men. It never says doubting Thomas. It says, you know what, that he was struggling with knowing about Jesus. He was struggling. And you know what Jesus did? He didn't mock him. He didn't say, Thomas, you're just like completely disqualified because you can't believe without seeing. You know what Jesus does? He shows up in that room. He shows up with Thomas. And he shows him his hands. And he shows him his side. And he says, look, if you need to touch me, touch me. Do what you need to do. So it doesn't disqualify you. Sometimes we think of doubt disqualifies you. You know, Jesus has even a place for doubt. He says, blessed are those that don't see and still believe. But you know what he says about Thomas? Blessed are those that see as well. Everybody's blessed. Everybody's blessed. Yeah. And so if you're a doubter today, guess what? Jesus shows up for you. I had a, I had a lady uh, about a month ago. Her name was Anne. And she was part of the uh, Belize Mennonite community. And Anne... Uh, was going to her Bible study, and she was going back to, to Belize. In fact, she's there right now. And Anne phoned me up, and she was flying away on a Tuesday to Belize, and she, she phoned me in a complete tizzy. And she said, I, ha- I need to see a miracle. I need to see a miracle. I know miracles are real and everything else, but there's something inside me that just needs to see a miracle. And, I, and you know what? I said, Anne, I said, not a problem. We can do that. And she was flying away on a Tuesday. I think she contacted me on a Friday. And so the next day was Saturday. I said, why don't you come with me Saturday afternoon? Come with me Saturday afternoon. I said, just me and you. Normally I take out big groups, but I'm happy. And just so you know here as well, if there's anybody here that ever wants to come out with me on, on, during the week or whatever, please contact me through Facebook. I'd love to take you out. I don't care if you're a group of one or a group of 20 or a group of 50, whatever it is. Come and, and come on the streets. But anyways, Anne phoned me up and she's in a tizzy. And she's just going through this dilemma in her faith. She, she really knows that Jesus is real, but there's just something inside of her that's really gnawing at her. And so I said, we'll come. And so she met me at 2 o'clock uh, on that Saturday, which was about a month ago. And uh, we met downtown. And I walked around and I walked to a table. And at this table was a dad, a uh, 16-year-old uh, daughter and an 18-year-old daughter. And I walked up to that table and I said, I, I talked to Anna a little bit. And I said, God meets you where you're at. God meets you where you're at. You know, she needed to see a miracle. And so you're not disqualified. And so I walked up to this table, and there was, I don't know, there's hundreds of people in that mall. It was full on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And I walked up to this table and I said, weird introductions. I do weird introductions sometimes. And I said, uh, who here is the person with the blind eye? I mean, that's, that's, if somebody came up to your table in the food court, just walked up to you uh, and just said that, that's kind of weird, right? And so they looked at each other. They looked at each other, they were like, oh, and then one, the 16 year old goes, uh, that would be me. And I said, oh really? I said, how long has your eye been blind for? And she said, it's been blind all my life. And I said, oh really? And I said, and before, and you know, I wasn't doubting her, but for Anne's sake, because Anne actually had come with me about a month earlier, and she'd actually seen a, lady, a prostitute get her eyes healed as well. But she said, well, that, that person wasn't reliable. I wasn't sure if she really got healed or not. Like she was playing that doubt game. Have you guys ever seen something God did and then later on you're like wondering if that was really God or not? Well, see, she got planted inside of her, but she was playing that doubt game. And she wasn't sure if that prostitute really got healed. I know that she did because I've seen so many miracles. I know God's doing that. But anyway, she was struggling with that. So anyways, after that, that girl said she was blind, I said, I said to the dad, are you sure she's blind? I was playing with him all I said, she, and she's, oh yeah, no, we know that she was, she was born blind. She, yep. Yeah. And I said to her sister, the 18-year-old sister, I said, I do believe your sister that she's got a blind eye. And she says, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, she definitely got a blind eye. There's, there's no doubt about it. And I said, Anne, are you convinced that this 16-year-old girl has a blind eye? And because if you're, if you're not convinced, because she told me the last time at the, the, with the prostitute that she wasn't convinced. So I said, do you have any questions for the man? Do you have any questions? And she's like, nope, I, I believe. I said, are you sure? Yeah, okay. I said, okay, you know that she's blind. All right. And I said to the I said to the 16-year-old girl, I said, cover your eye, cover your good eye. Because she said, you have one good eye and one blind eye. 
And so I said, come to your eye. And I said, what do you see? And she said, well, I can't see anything. And uh, I said, all right. And I said, all we're going to do is we're going to put my hand on your eye for just one moment. And then all I want you to do is check to see what you can see out there. And she's like, okay. And so we laid a hand on her eye for like two seconds. We just come in blindness to go. Who knows that we don't have to do the, the 900 minute prayer to see a blind eye open, right? We don't. We're ambassadors of Christ, right? Boom. It's like, if you, if you take a 900 pound sledgehammer, uh, you know, to, a, to a, a little, a little uh, crumpled up something, guess what? When you slam that sledgehammer, you don't have to do it twice. And so, that, that demon didn't have a chance. And so, and so we just commanded blindness to go out. We took the hand off. And you know what? She did the same thing as so many others. First thing she did before she said anything, huge smile came across her face. Huge smile. You knew she could see already. And then, of course, we had her test it. And guess what? That blind eye that had been blind all her life actually saw better than her other eye that she said was good. I asked her to compare her eyes, and the blind eye now saw perfectly. She said the other eye is fuzzy compared to that one. I said, guess what? I said, we know how to fix that too. And I said, Anne, don't put your hand on that eye. And so she put that hand on the other eye, and she had perfect sight in both her eyes. Both her eyes. And so Anne got to see it. Anne got to see it. Anne needed, like Thomas, she needed to see it. And so it's okay. It's okay. I want to give you guys permission today to just experience God. And whatever you think is disqualifying you from your miracle today, whether it's in your body, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your marriage, whatever relationship, I want to tell you that that is a lie. If you're allergic to religion, let's agree together that there is nothing separating you. There is no belief system that's separating you. There's nothing that's separating you. The lie is that there's something separating you. There's nothing separating from you from your miracle today. You are all eligible for your miracle today. There's nothing separating you. And this is the good news that Jesus came to preach. This is the good news. He would hang out with prostitutes. He would end, you know, tax collectors had a special category of sin, right? It's like, it's like prostitutes were like in one category, and like the general sinners, and then the tax collectors were at the top of the heap, right? You guys know that, right? Because tax collectors were like Jews that had turned on their own people and were like shaking them down for money. So it's like, it's like the sinners plus the tax collectors. But you know, when Jesus hung out with the tax collectors, Guess what? They got healed too. Zacchaeus, man, Zacchaeus spent a, a supper or a, a, a meal with Jesus, and he came away and he said, "You know, I've wronged anybody. I'll repay them, right? And we'll do all this thing." And, and Jesus proclaimed over over him. He said, "Truly, salvation has come to this house. Truly, salvation." And so Zacchaeus found out that he wasn't he wasn't disqualified from the love of God. He was not. Even the most evil person, considered the most evil, vile, nasty person. He was kind of like ISIS, you know, among the Jewish people. He was like this traitor. And you know what? He received from the Father. Who thinks that they're an ISIS person here? Who is shaking down your neighbors? Who's going around robbing people but having the authority of the government beside? Right? Is there anybody here that's walking around with the RCMP shaking down the local neighborhood? Right? Most reviled and hated? No. Nobody's like that here. Well, hey, you know what? If you're under that, if you're, if you're at that level or less, guess what? You get to qualify for salvation today. You get to qualify for salvation today. You are eligible. You know, and I think so much of the time, we, we disqualify ourselves. We disqualify ourselves and say, for this reason, for that reason, I didn't receive my miracle. You know, and that is a lie. It is a total lie. You're not disqualified. You know, you know how, we get, how we came to Christ? How did we come to Christ? Did we confess all our sins? Did we get baptized in the water? Is that how we came to Christ? No, that's not how we came to Christ. That meant, that's a fruit of coming to Christ. But we came to Christ by believing in His salvation. We came to Christ by believing in His salvation, right? Something that He did, and we just agreed with what He did. All we did was agree. We didn't do anything. We did not do anything other than agree with the truth. And that is what the renewal of the mind is. All the renewal of the mind. And renewal of the mind is not memorizing 1,500 scriptures. Renewal of the mind is not going on a mantra saying, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. That is not the renewal of the mind. That is religion. Because you're trying to become something that you already are. I'm not putting down scriptures. I love scriptures. I read the Bible daily. I love memorizing stuff. I love repeating the scriptures that I, I get into me, and I love repeating them in my prayer time to God, but I'm not trying to become those things. I'm agreeing what He says. 
And there's a big difference. Religion has this fine, funny line. And, and it looks very similar. You know, it can look so similar. And we can, and we can just get tricked, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's this fine line of deception. And just because we say stuff, you know, because we talk about, oftentimes we'll hear, you know, just speak the word over your situation. Just do this, just do that. But the thing is, that we're not trying to cause something to happen. The kingdom of God is here already. We're not trying to bring the kingdom. Jesus did all that hard work. He did it all. All yeah. we're doing is agreeing with the truth. You yeah. are healed already. You're not trying to become healed. Uh, you've got Ender Wong stuff on the back counter there. You know that already. We've already got it, right? We've already got it. You're not trying to become healed. You are healed. Because you're identifying, you're identifying with that fire inside. You're identifying with that breath. You're identifying with the identity of God inside of you. This is who we're identifying. We have this already. And in order to see the manifestation, right, we agree that with the truth. And then what happens? Believe that you have received, and then you shall have it, right? And this is the process. We agree. All we're doing is aligning ourselves with the truth. This is what renewing of the mind looks like. And it's so much simpler than mantras. It's so much simpler than, than fasting and praying for the sake of trying to gain something. I love fasting and praying. That's a, you know, it's important. Some people think that it, in the New Testament you're not supposed to fast anymore. So, But if you do uh, a quick word study on fasting in the New Testament, you'll find that Paul and others uh, regularly did fasting. But you know, they weren't fasting to get something from God. They were fasting because they were in alignment with Him. And they wanted to, they wanted to see that. They wanted the cloudiness in their mind to go so they could see the truth. And so all we're doing when we're spending time with Daddy is we are just saying, thank you, Daddy, for changing me. That I am a new creation. Right? Same the message we had for praise. We are new creations. We're not becoming new creations. We are new creations. Amen. This is good news. We are. Amen. We are. We are. And you know, as you align yourself with that, you know, you'll see the manifestation. Believe that you have, and you will have it. And stay on that path. Stay on that path. Because the renewal of the mind is all it is, is a continual alignment with the existing truth. And it takes the pressure off of you. It totally takes the pressure. If it's already done by Christ, the pressure is off. This is the rest that we're supposed to enter, right? Hebrews 3 talks about the rest, entering the rest. Right? Jesus said, come to me all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes. The rest is that he did it. We're not trying to do it. We're not, I, I was mentioning last night, I was speaking last night at another church service, and I said, we're not Mormons. And I said, I said, and I didn't want to be little the Mormons, but I said the Mormons. I was actually I was making this so fun. I said, I said the, the Mormons they have a different view of Jesus. I think Jesus and Satan are brothers. But anyways, one of the things that they have is they have holy underwear. I don't know if you guys know what holy underwear or not. Anybody ever say the Mormons they got holy underwear? And so Temple Mormons wear this holy one underwear. And I, the point I was making is that it was Jesus plus something, right? It's always religion always says, oh God did something for us, but we got to do our part. Right? God, God uh, you know, makes a way, but you gotta, you got to do the rest of it. And that's religion. And whether you got to wear holy underwear, uh, whether you got to say a mantra, whether you got to do whatever, right? we're not adding to our salvation. You can't add to your salvation. Right? Who knows that we can't add to it, right? And so if we can't add to it, then there's only one thing for us to do, and to agree that we are the children of God, that, that He has set us free. And if you're using your five senses to judge what God has done for you, guess what? It's just to be... To be uh, carnally minded, right? To be five sense minded is death, yeah. right? To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Yeah, so if you're if you're experiencing death, if you're experiencing destructive emotions in your life, if you're experiencing, you know what? Just get your eyes. It's a simple process. Get your eyes off the five senses. Quit judging what God has or hasn't done for you based on your five senses, yeah. and get into your closet, get into your work, and find out what God has done for you. And as we agree in the spirit. Right? What happens is it manifests. It's a simple process, and we see it all the time on the streets. We see it all the time in our lives. And I want to encourage each one of us today to, to recognize that we are not trying to become. Jesus was successful. He did it. When He said it was finished on the cross, He didn't mean it finished for Him, and then there was this bunch of stuff for us to do. When He said it was finished, salvation was finished. Our job is to agree with the truth. And so for those of you here that uh, have something that they're dealing with, which is pretty much 100% of us, right? I had, a, I had a great question. I was in the, I was in the mall a couple weeks ago, and I prayed for a lady's eyes, and her eyes got better. She, she, she was wearing glasses. She wasn't blind, but, but she was wearing glasses. And uh, I laid hands on her, and I took my hands off, and she had perfect sight. 
And she was enjoying that. And then she had an excellent question for me. Such an excellent question. And she said, if I get my sight back, I just got my sight back. She said, why are you wearing your glasses? A great question. Man, one of the most observant people I've, I've ever prayed for. Great. I, I've had that question a few times. But it's usually from people that have seen my videos or whatever and watched them a bunch of time and realize the guy that's praying for these blind guys has got glasses on. And you know, I just said to her, I said, that's so observant. That's, that's an excellent question. I said, sometimes it's easier for, for us to believe for others, right, than it is to believe for ourselves. And I said, I'm a journey for myself. I said, that's such a good question. I said, I'm a journey for myself. I am believing for myself. I'm growing in that area. I spend time with Abba in that area. But you know what? Sometimes it's easier. And some of us... You know, we'll get ourselves healed and then we have trouble getting other people healed because sometimes it's just a belief system. There's it's nothing about the salvation. There's not Holy Spirit's not playing, you know, some weird game with us or whatever. All it is is us agreeing with the truth. And so I'm I'm not disqualified for praying for the blind. I'm not disqualified from praying for whoever just because I have stuff in my own life. And so never let yourself be disqualified because you're on some journey. Right? I brought people along with me that had all kinds of ailments. I brought a lady along uh, not that long ago that had a blind eye, and she actually stopped me. She joined one of my Thursday classes. She saw the videos, and she came. Uh, she came with me on the streets. And just before we were going to go 100 feet, before we talked to our first people on the street, she turns to me and she said, "Pray for me." I said, "Oh." I said, "What do we need to pray for?" And she said, well, "I see your videos, and I got a blind eye." And I said, "Oh, you do?" And she said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. pray for me." And I said, "Well, I'm not going to pray for you right now, but I said I'm going to pray for you in a couple minutes." And she said, what do you mean? Why, why are you, you going to pray for me now? What's in a couple minutes? And I said, you'll see. And we, and we walked around the corner, literally walked. She stopped me. I know exactly where I was in this mall. And, and, and she stopped me. And she said, I want to pray. And I walked around the corner to, to the, I love hanging around the food courts. A lot of my stories are food court stories because people are just sitting there. They're just like, they're just like waiting for the gospel. It's like, wow, look at that. The whole church congregation, they're all waiting for Jesus. It's like, wow, it's just like a kid in the candy store. I go to a food court. It's like, woo! And so I walked, I walked with this lady and I walked straight to one table. Bang! And I walked to this, this uh, table and there was a, a, a couple that were there. And, they, and uh, I walked up to them and I said, who's got the, who's got the blind eye? I mean, my blind eye things. You know, I, I walked up to people and I asked them these questions. I said, who's got the blind eye? And one of the guys had like massive glasses on his face. And it turns out he had one like super, super nasty eye. And then he had one blind eye, totally blind. And, uh, and I said, okay, and I'm talking to this guy, and I said, this is what's going to happen when you lay hands on your eyes, and you're, you're going to get your healing back. And he's like, I said, you believe that? I actually had that one on video. And he's like, mm, he's not saying anything. He's like, this guy is nuts. Uh, but he's open to it. You know, I don't ask people to believe what I believe when I'm in the food courts or wherever else. I just ask them if they're open to it. You know what, that's enough. That's, what, that's all they need to be open. Who are you going to find in the food, food court that's got the same belief system as this nutcase over here, right? You're not going to find it. You're just not. And so they, I ask for them to be open to it. So anyways, uh, he takes off his glasses, everything's ready, and, and guess what? This lady's like, oh, can I see my first blind eye ever? And I said, and just before I prayed for her, I said, oh, and this lady over here, she knows how to do it. And she's like, I can just see her, her eyes go that big and her jaw goes, who's a point? It's like, ah. Uh, just asking a lady with a blind eye to pray for somebody with a blind eye. And so I could see, I could see, I knew I'd done this before. I love playing with people. I love having fun. I'm so bad sometimes. But I said, hey, I said, she knows how to do it. I could just see, like, if I told her five seconds earlier, she would have run. But I didn't give her, I gave her one second. I, I just told her that, and I said, hey, take your hand. And I think she was still just, no. I said, take your hand, and I just took her hand. <laughs> Put it on this guy's eye. And, uh, and she's like, total fear. Total fear. She's in complete fear. She, who knows that the, that the face C doesn't have to be too big? Did you know that you can have 99.999 repeating doubt, but 0.1%, right? 0.1% is just a little bit of faith. I believe she had a little bit of faith. A wee little bit, but she had some. Somewhere in there. Because she's a Christian, right? So if you're a Christian, you got faith. You got something. You can't be a Christian and not have faith, right? If you're a Christian, you got enough faith, right? It's not a matter of a mile, right? If you're a believer, you got it. And so anyways, I had her put her hand on this guy's eye and just speak those simple words, in Jesus' name, blindness go. And she took off her hand and to everybody's amazement, I guess I wasn't that amazed because I've seen it before. I always enjoy a miracle. But the guy got his eyesight back. The guy got his eyesight back. 
And you know what? If she thought she was disqualified for so many reasons, right? One of them, her being having a blind eye as well. And you know what? She can lay hands and see that blind eye recover as well. And so we are, and she, you know what? She comes with us now regularly on the streets. She, she, she's home now. And you know what? She's still.